Hello and welcome to Creating Apart, the first digital showcase of East and Southeast Asian graduates in the UK. My name is Adrian Tang and I am a theatre maker based in Reading. I am also the artistic director of Exit Pursued by Panda and the producer of Creating Apart. I'm really looking forward to presenting these incredible performances of our graduates to you, but before we do, I have a few things to mention. We are fundraising for Black Ticket Project, a charity that creates cultural access points for young black people. I believe it's important that our two communities support each other as we have similar goals. Please consider donating whatever you can afford. The Patreon link is in the description below. The Showcase is a series of monologues up to three minutes in length by over 30 graduates supported by a dozen directors. We have representatives who are of Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Malaysian, Korean, Singaporean and Uyghur Uzbek descent. I'd like to thank all the publishers and writers who have very kindly provided their permissions for their texts to be used. The showcase will be divided into two halves, each half lasting approximately 45 minutes with a two minute break in the middle acting as an interval. All of the monologues have been captioned to improve accessibility. If you'd like to tweet along, please follow at Creating Apart for more information on each actor and their chosen monologue, myself at Tangfastic for insight and behind the scenes stories, and use the hashtag BESEA Showcase. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy the performances. disgraced me and hindered me half a million laughed at my losses mocked at my gains scorned my nation thwarted my bargains called my friends heated mine enemies and what's his reason I am a Jew, hath not a Jew eyes, hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means. Warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, what is his humility? Revenge. If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by Christian example? Why revenge? The villainy you teach me, I will execute. And it shall go hard. But I will better the instruction.
I think I finally understand why they say that you lose your virginity. I always thought that was a dumb expression. It makes it sound as if your virginity is this special sacred thing you're supposed to guard with your life. But to me, the fact that I never had sex was like a flashing neon sign saying ugly loser hanging over my head. I was trying to lose it. You know, for a couple of years there, I was trying to throw it at anyone who gave me a second look. But now, I do feel like I lost something. Not my purity or innocence or any of that dogmatic bullshit. I lost the ability to distance myself from the rest of the lowly humans. My position of self-deprecating superiority that let me live without hope for all those years. I lost my isolation. I let you in. And I gave you the power to hurt me. You'll notice that traveling down these blood vessels of our living city creature, night buses are packed with blood cells, red and white. Them's the passengers, you and you, it's a normal night. Some of you are light, more of you get on and pack it tight. But all is well, because blood cell to blood cell is nothing to fear. Not unless something sneaks in through the back door before the driver has a chance to shut it. And it's pushing, and it's nudging. And it's shoving up the place and you can't see its face because it's got a hoodie on its head but you can see its waist because it's got its trousers down its legs so you can see its boxer shorts. But of course, you ain't judging. Because it's nothing you ain't seen before, you're just collectively aware of him. And there's nothing wrong with that because he jumped in through the back. But blood cells don't like scraggy surprises coming through the back door in dark baggy disguises. It piques the nervousness. The whole blood temperature rises. And for safety purposes, word to the wise, avert your eyes and sit in silence. The doors close. The night bus pulls away. So now there's no getting off. And if you're wise enough, you'll know not all of us aboard this bus are blood cells. Nah, one of us is virus. You think you want Harry. That's not what you really want. From where you're standing, from stolen moments, a drink down the pub. Gentle, clever, witty, wise. He's wise as me. Those quotes. If you were to tear off the rosy tinted spectacles for a second, really look at him. He's not funny. He makes jokes, they're not funny. He's gentle, yes. He's very kind and gentle. 
ready to run your hot bath at the end of a long day, ready to stir your coffee when you just put the sugar in, ready to do for you the thousand and one tiny little things in your day you never ask for help with and could easily do for yourself. And worst of all, you know what? He's boring. I have to play solitaire on my phone during conversations just to maintain stimulation and vital parts of my brain. He interrupts me constantly when I'm trying to work, inexplicably narrating his every move. Just gonna go check on the fish. Oh, another email from Graham. Let's just see what's in channel four for a minute. Do it! Just fucking do it, Harry! Don't tell me about it, just fucking do it! He whines when he's sick. He cheats when he's losing. He kisses like a trout and he weeps when he comes. Why does he stay with this girl? With this monster? That's what you think though, isn't it? Just say it. I'm a monstrous bitch. And you could look after him much better, couldn't you? That's what you think. Don't you? hang up. I get out of the car. I can hardly breathe. I'm standing on the side of the highway. I don't know whether to turn around or to keep going. I'm somewhere between who I was and who I'm going to be. I want my dad. I want my brother and my sisters. I want my mom. I want my mom, but I can't think of her, of them, not now, because if I do, then my chest will explode. I literally feel like I'm going to fall to pieces, that my arms are gonna fall off, and then my legs, and then my head, and so to keep myself from coming apart, I make a list of things I know to be true. I know that having your heart broken by a boy from Spain won't be the worst thing that happens to you. I know that things can't remain the same no matter how much you want them to. I know that people aren't perfect, even the ones you love, especially the ones you love and that love isn't enough to save them. I know what grief tastes like. It's bitter. I know what it sounds like. It's loud. And I know that on the day my mother died, my childhood finally ended. I know that summer turns to autumn and that autumn becomes winter and winter to spring and spring back to summer and it goes on. Life, it goes on. You're gonna find this weird, given my thing with squiggles and things that aren't. But I love, I fucking love the circle line on the tube. Because in actual fact, the circle line isn't a circle at all. It's almost a square. If you want a straight line, then that's your line. And you know, the map, the tube map, I can really, I really get it. Even though normally the colors, all those colors would normally send me into a bit of a, because, because they're so, because that map, it's actually how the world should be, you know? The first true maps I've seen online, they were these accurate to scale things. But as with, you know, as with everything, when you look at it to scale, it was a mess, this headache. But the designer, Beck his name was, look him up. He designed, oh, what are they called? Like a circuit diagram things. 
He grabbed the idea and reshaped it to create the singular most, not to scale, seriously, <laughs> most inaccurate map in the world. But by far, by far the most beautiful. <laughs> Everything was straight, either vertical, horizontal, or 45 degree lines only. And picking out colours that just feel right. They don't blend or wash over each other. The red central line through the middle, which helps the eye distinguish between north and south. Then the black arrow of the northern line piercing through the middle, east and west. <laughs> the district line should be green. <laughs> it just should be a poo like brown for the Bakerloo. It just feels right. And I just... I wish that the rest of the world can be so easily redesigned and compartmentalised and ordered so that it fits. And I think that's what this is all about, isn't it? I'm starting to realise. It's changed. Running. More people out there doing it. More people jogging, which is odd, really. Everyone's supposed to be locked down. Joggers are annoying if you're a runner. You have to curve your path around them and that breaks your focus. Or curves your focus. Who wants a curved focus? But there's a lot of that going on at the moment. Focus, curving, arcing your run away from other people. You know the one thing I've seen more of when I'm out running? Families. It's nice. Moms and dads looking more relaxed, like there's nowhere else they're supposed to be. Which is true at the moment. It's strangely beautiful, actually. And uh, I know why I like the side of that, the side of families being families. I never really had it myself, so it's appealing. So I run towards it and then I run away from it because I can't look at it for too long. You see, my mom got ill and then my dad left, or my dad left and then my mom got ill. I'm not really sure which version makes me feel better. Anyway, I stayed. I don't exactly know what's wrong with my mom. I mean, there is a diagnosis, but that's just a set of words for me to get medication for her. My mom hasn't left the flat for almost four years now. It's how she lives. It's how I've had to live. So actually the lockdown has made no difference to her at all. But it's made a difference to me. I find it very difficult only being able to go out once a day. It's like a safety valve that has been taken away. So actually running has become more important to me, more of a release than it's ever been. And it's tough coming home. It's tough because I know that when this is all over, I will have to curve my run away from my mom. And it won't be to keep her safe. It'll be to keep me safe. Curving the run away from my mom and I am dreading that moment. Men don't have figures. 
they've got jobs and flash cars and important things to worry about. You don't talk about their legs, do you? <laughs> Look, if, if I could grow six inches and be as fat as I am now, I'd be really tall and thin. I could stretch out all the fat on my legs till they were long and slender. I'd go out. I'd buy silky underwear with lots of lace on it and suspenders. And that's what I'd wear. Wouldn't wear anything else because that would spoil it. <laughs> They'd see me approach, just my feet and fuck me, stilettos and doors would open like magic and uniformed men would be bowing. Then I'd meet someone. Oh, we wouldn't talk. Christ, we'd be really... <laughs> we'd just be there. He'd look at me like this. The whole place would be mirrors and he'd be looking at my legs. I've been eating all day. Got up this morning and I knew I was gonna do it. The trouble is I don't really find my body disgusting enough. That's got to be the answer. I mean, if I was stones and stones of a way to be clear as day, I always thought that. It's a lot easier to do big things like realize there's nothing for it but to just wire your jaws together and stop eating completely. I don't have enough self-loathing for that. It's either that or I can't be bothered to face it every day. It's a constant, gnawing, boring distraction. I don't know whether to treat myself or to whip myself. Lose a pound and buy a dress or go to the movies and eat chocolates and indulge how much I hate myself. What a stupid waste of time and effort. I'm not fucking perfect and that's that. want to be an amazing pair of legs in sunglasses getting into a car. Did that really happen? I can't. No one could be that incompetent. No one could be that stupid, right? When you said you had the music covered, I trusted you. All you had to do was pick some songs, plug in your iPod, and press play. Simple. So why are you blasting out all the single ladies? Because there's only one single lady here, and she's a widow. Did you not have the time in your busy schedule to put on the right playlist? Or was it too hard to click off the naughties bangers you were bopping to in your car? And when you realised, when you fixed your mistake, why was the rest of the music a bombing run on our emotions? You'll never walk alone. He's a Man U fan. My heart will go on from Titanic. Our aunt died at sea. Always look on the bright side of life. I... Well, that was all right, I guess. But then, somewhere over the rainbow, he's not somewhere over the rainbow, is he? He's not playing with Dorothy and Toto. I don't care if, if it's tradition, it's not. I can't just click my heels and make everything all right again. It's fantasy, it's all, it's a fucking lie. And we keep lying to ourselves. Generation after generation about this mystery of life. But it's not a mystery, is it? He's dead. He's in a wooden box, six feet under, and that's where he's gonna stay. And that little tombstone there, that's gonna be there for years, but it's only gonna be a couple of weeks before he's a rotting pile of flesh and bones. All that hope, all that magical bullshit, makes it 10 times worse when it's ripped away from you. I just, I just wanted this beautiful service with carnations all around the room and some old granny playing hymns on an organ. When it was over, we'd have the reception at the horse and groom and we'd drink and we'd laugh and we'd cry. Coughing cost so much I could barely afford the church, let alone the rest. 
So I settled. And I shouldn't have. I should have saved for a rainy day, but no. It's all my fault. If you could see this now, it'd be fucking fuming. You can't. But you would be. You deserve so much more than this. But I suppose I don't know if that really matters now. What's done is done. Maybe the magic's in the memories. I feel really sorry for you. No, Thomas. I feel really sorry. I do. I promise. I do. I'm feeling sorrow right now. You have a kid, don't you? You do. I know you do. So, so you don't need to hide it. You have a kid. Yeah. Tough. What's its name? Is it Harry? It is Harry. I know it is. Do you know how I know this? It's because once when we left work, I was walking behind you and you walked all the way down the road and I could see you in front of me. And I watched you meet this woman in a coffee shop. It wasn't even a nice coffee shop. I was surprised you went into it. It was a Costa or something. Not even a good one, a shit Costa. And I watched you meet this woman and she had this little toddling little thing. And I waited and I saw you go to the loo and then I ran in and said, oh, I was hoping to catch you. Uh, and I had a little chat with um, Marion. Is that her name? Your ex? And she told me all about Harry and I pretended I was a colleague and you were taking ages in the toilet. Actually, we talked about that. We didn't know what you were up to in there, but it meant we had a good talk about you. <laughs> and in the end, when you still didn't come out, I said I needed to dash and I'd catch you tomorrow instead, but that conversation with her gave me quite a lot of crucial information, which I've always known when you've tried to lie or hide things or whatever. I've always known about your life. Things that you don't know, I know. I know you have to pay Marion that certain amount every month. And when she hears you're out of work, her low estimation of you will drop even further. It will, I promise. And she won't be surprised. And that's the really tragic thing. She won't be like, oh my God, you lost your job? Oh my God. She'd be like, yeah, of course he lost his job, fucking retard. Good thing I got out while I could not let him see Harry too much. Don't want Harry to grow up in this distorted, disabled image of his fucking drip drip of a father. No. <laughs> I expect that's what she'll think. When I was 13, my dad gave me some invaluable tips and advice on talking to girls, or picking them up, as he called it. I said that sounded a bit kidnappy to me. He said, that's a good way to look at it. You've got to get hold of them, ideally metaphorically, emotionally and intellectually. But if it means physically as well, then so be it. The timing of his sudden coaching session was in hindsight dubious. Now he and Mum broke up two months later. Turned out Dad had fabricated a few far afield business meetings. He made a massive faux pas when Mum approached him about it, saying he hadn't lied, that they were meetings, and he definitely got down to business. And that was that. Suitcase down out of the attic, packed and gone. 
Yeah. That was my relationship guru, my love Yoda. Pick up and romance girls you shall. Off to school Melanie and Shrewsbury am I. So, was I popular with the girls? <laughs> well, put it this way, after the school disco of 2003, I was known as Neanderthal Nick, but nothing even happened. I just said to a group of girls that picking a girl up sounds a lot like a caveman whacking a woman round the head and dragging her off into the forest. I mean, I know now I should have said it. It was hardly a winning chat-up line, but in no time all sorts of stupid rumours were flying around Apparently, I decapitated a girl on a German school trip because I said about her being off her head. I mean, that doesn't even work. If she was decapitated, her head would be off her, not her off her head. When I was 16, they got back together again. Uh, my parents, I mean, not the decapitated girl's head in her body. That was, that was all made up anyway. Stop picturing it. Uh, my folks together again. Mom pops. As it had been. It felt like we were a unit again. No stopping us. Then some woman in Ipswich gave birth to my stepsister. So yeah, that was that again. I called him this morning. He ended the call by saying his friend's sister was at the train station and needed picking up. I knew what he meant, and he knew I knew. So, how do I look? It's my first date in quite some time. You could say things are picking up. Look at me. I can always notice your touch. It feels different. My neck smells of you. My clothes smell of you. My lips taste of you. I ached to be surrounded by you, to tangle myself into you, to trace the curves of your face, to outline the alphabet and your bare skin, to hold your head to my chest, to fit my hand into yours, to gift you with half awake kisses hear your mumbles under the pillows, to be the cushion that you lie upon, to surprise you with food, to drink until I'm drunk with you, to be carried by you when my feet hurt, to share a coat with you under the rain, to kiss you on an empty night tube, to wander the city pavements with you, to wipe away your sadness. To make you feel loved. To make you want to be loved. But I'm afraid of you. All I needed was for you to look at me when my chest could not stop strangling itself, hands could not stop smothering the other, my mind would not hit mute to the endless channels of noise. Five minutes of you in exchange for the hours and hours and hours of me.
Yesterday, I actually found the courage to message a new match first instead of collecting them like rare Pokemon. I messaged Quarantino Milan with, Hi, you okay? He replied, Yeah, you cool? WID today. I said, I ate ice cream for breakfast, went for my hour of exercise, only lasted 10 minutes. Okay, three and a half. Had a glass of burnt water for lunch, prepared romantic dinners for two, regretted eating two dinners. Check my reflection. Seems like I'm losing weight and gaining weight simultaneously. I mean, they even brought back Mr. Motivator from the dead and I have the cheek to be in here looking like a whole Mr. Potato Head. I then did a spot of uncontrollable crying into the 38 packs of toilet roll masquerading as ornaments around the house. Quarantino Milan replied with, Hey sugar butt, how aware are you of past traumas and suppressed emotions? Sorry to be like this, I just need assurances before you end up projecting all that weird shit on me. Not to be rude, but I just don't have the capacity for it. I've got a lot on. Council tax is due, can't find flour anywhere. Sprinkle cake costs 75 pounds, and I'm working from home with three knobhead kids and a badger called Tyrone Cumberbatch. Hope you're well and safe though, and speak again soon. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think, what's the point? Surely we're all just here collecting information about someone until we realize we really, really don't like them and we've been cursed by the old lady from Snow White to be alone forever. Today the app suggested I change to the Find Friends setting. Anyway, people say I talk a lot. You seem like a breath of fresh air. How are you finding it all? Yeah, so, uh, anyway, I went to this place, which is something I had never done, and this woman answered the door. And from the minute I saw her, I was hoping that she wasn't- I mean, she's a bit older! Anyway, she brought me into this room, and there was just a couch there, and a shower in the corner, and some towels on a chair, and she told me that this girl, Jeanette, would be in in a minute, and it was 30 euros to be there, and whatever I work out with Jeanette was between ourselves. So I- just, fuck it. I had a shower. In the corner. And I dried myself. And I put my clothes back on. And I'm in there maybe 15 minutes and nothing's happening, you know? So I stick my head out the door. And I don't see anyone. And I decide to wait. And then I hear the doorbell go. And this woman brings in some other guy and she takes him off somewhere. And by this stage, I'm like, freaking out! Really? But at the same time, I'm hoping for a bit of... You know? I'm hanging in there. So I wait, and I hear a bit of movement, and then I hear someone leave. So I think, oh, oh yeah, yeah, maybe it's gonna happen now. And then 20 minutes go by, and I'm just like, forget it. So I open the door to go, and the woman who let me in is coming down the hall going like, hey, what are you doing? Go back in there and have a shower. And she comes right up to me, and the smell of drink off her, you know? And I'm like, look, I'm gonna leave it. And then this bloke appears out of nowhere, you know? Like a proper skanger, just with these really dead eyes, you know? And he's like, what's going on? And they're much louder than they have to be, if you know what I mean. And for some reason, I just decide that I'm not gonna take this fucking shit anymore! I've had enough! So although I'm probably definitely on a hiding to nothing, I say, Give me my 30 euros back! Which of course is madness, you know? But of course this is fucking madness, you know? So she shouts, We don't owe you any money! We provided the amenities, which is what you pay for! We don't owe you a fucking penny! And I suppose these two represent everything that's wrong in the world to me. And I'm refusing to accept this, you know? And I'm demanding my money back! I just want to have a transaction where some normal rules apply again. 
And look where I tried to fucking achieve that! Oh! I was at the cemetery with Al today to visit his grandma, his ama, and tidy up her grave. They've been very close. Every afternoon she would buy him a can of coke and a packet of sung boy. You know, preserve sour plums. I guess it doesn't matter. It's not like you understand me anyway. Dad never taught me Hananese because it's not a practical language to learn. But I guess it's okay, Amma. We have a language of our own, right? You'll buy me a can of Coke and a large square biscuit. We'll sit together, I'll eat, you'll watch me eat, and we'll just smile at each other. You'll ask me, Hu Jia Bui Bo, which I think means have you eaten, and I'll say, Ko Jia Bo Liao, yes I have. When I was at Al's grandma's grave this morning, I saw him take out two small red cups of tea, a can of coke, and a packet of sing boy. He said, Amma, jia jia, e e. Then he smiled at the black and white photo. When Al was 15, she called him to come home. She cooked him dinner like she always did, but he was out with his friends. He didn't want to come home to eat with an old woman. I don't want that to happen to us, Amma. I want to talk to you. I want to ask you how your day is, what you think about, what you think about me, a girl who can't cook or speak your language. If you miss home, if you miss Akong, if you're happy. I've tried to bridge this gap between us. I've tried to learn Hainanese. I guess it's just easier to put a biscuit on my flat tongue and chew and smile at you as you smile at me. I fucking hate pineapple juice. I fucking hate doctors. I fucking hate pineapple juice and I fucking hate doctors. The nurse who came in here earlier said that pineapple juice was good because it aided healing and helped boost your energy. And I said, babes, there is no way you want me any more energetic if I do a cartwheel in these curtains. My ass will be out in three seconds flat. Sorry. I'm not usually this aggy. It's been a bad week. Bad year. And I don't like looking like I'm weak. All of these Balamori rejects in here looking at me like I'm a fucking sob story. I'm fine. And it's none of these stiffs business anyway. It's not just them though. Um, my brothers were here earlier. There's five of them. There's Ross, who's the oldest. Then there's Reggie, who's 15, who keeps getting in trouble for looking at porn on the school computers. <laughs> and then um, there's Marvin and Aston, who came along when my mum was going through a really big JLS revival period. Um, and then last but not least is baby Jamie, who I think might be an actual sociopath. <laughs> I mean, he's only nine months old, but you can really see it in his eyes. Luckily, it was just Reggie and the twins who came today. Thank fuck. <laughs> I don't know if I could deal with the whole wolf pack. They left pretty sharpish because the lady from the police station came again. They never leave me alone. They want my help locking someone up. Thing is, I'm not a fucking snitch and I don't need their help. So. Her name's PC Andrews. The police officer. She speaks dead calm. She must be from, like, a nice part of London or something because that's the way she talks. She looks at me like I'm tiny. Oh, 
it makes no difference if you press charges or not. <laughs> um, uh, uh, it, uh, it will only help us put a very dangerous group of people behind bars. Ooh. <laughs> oh, do you know it was dead interesting? Um, I asked her what happened if a victim refused to press charges in cases like this, and she told me the investigation would still go on ahead like a murder. Because in a murder, the victim is never there, are they? They're dead. Written off. So I suppose this is a good way of thinking about it. Like I'm dead. In the ground. And they just have fingerprints and bloodstains and shit to work with. You don't remember me, I'm not. I'm Lou. We met at uh, Army Cadet 10 years ago. You don't remember, that's fine. I don't cry. Uh, ever. <laughs> Doctor said I was hard as fuck, so. Uh, as a baby. So. Don't feel anything at all. Never have. Except this one night with you. You don't remember that. Uh... It was last night of cadets camp. The boys sneak into our dorm because the girls want to play this game thing where you have to guess where our nipples are. Guess our nipples and belly buttons with our pajamas on, <laughs> which is erotic and challenging because we're all different, aren't we? Some people have really like low nipples or whatever. And anyways, you're paired with me because no one else, I guess maybe we're getting bullied. You seem upset, you don't want to do it. You look at the floor and you sort of jab your finger at me and turn to go, but you... You get it? You get me? Bang on. I left one. <laughs> I think you feel it. And I say, wowza! <laughs> like that, breathy, wowza! And then people cheer, cause Maybe they're bullying still, but I don't care because it feels real, like a rom-com. And you have this smile, I notice it. And, and, and then you guess my right one, and you get that too. And I suppose it's easier after you get the first one because you sort of line them up, don't you? I wouldn't know. And then I nod, <laughs> and then you move your hand down to my, to my stomach, <laughs> and you look me in the eye for the first time. And I didn't mind looking in yours. Uh, sorry, uh, hang on.
came up, I bought flowers, and I'm seeing someone, sort of. I think, I think you'll like him. He's sweet to me, kind. I don't know, I'm not very good with this. I don't know if it's because I'm scared of rejection, but I feel like I don't allow myself to open up expect the worst from them and they won't disappoint you. You know who I saw in town today? Catherine. She asked about you. Sometimes I take out your perfume. It smells of you. Is it weird that I have a bottle of Chanel number no. five and I just sniff it? <laughs> like a drug, in a way. Everyone's asking how I'm doing, how I'm feeling. I just give them the standard, yeah, fine. I'm not good with emotions or talking through shit. They're trying to send me to counselling and I'm thinking just because I don't want to talk it through doesn't mean I don't bloody well care. Anyway, I have you to talk to. You, you always said I'll go places that I'll make something of my life. But what if I don't? I'm, I'm scared I'm gonna disappoint you. You thought this would drive me, push me to go further, but I feel stuck. I, the world is moving, but I can't move with it. And I want to. I want to move. I want to do things in my life. I want to make it mean something. I just want to fucking let go. <laughs> but I can't. I'm holding on. To what? Sometimes I forget. I pick up the phone to tell you something and... I just miss you. When I began my labours with my son, it was a hot day though, late in the year, and I was taken with a desire to have trees all around me and not be seen, which is something I will regret until the day I die, but that's no use shutting the gate after the pigs escaped. I spied a woman gathering blackberry, squat in front of the brambles, her apron covered in black stains, and her, her skin was pink, and her hair was golden and pinned like a cottage loaf on her head with a, a pretty stone hanging from each ear. It was the 20th of October, well after Michaelmas, and too late to be blackberrying. And this is something that my mother was very superstitious about, so I, I called out, even in my discomfort, to tell her not to eat the fruit, for the devil will have put his hoof on it. But the woman turned and said, I am the devil. And I, I saw how pretty she was, and, and that each stone hanging from her ear was her pearl white tooth, and I saw the hooves beneath her skirts and that her chin was wet for she she wasn't gathering blackberries after all but spitting on them to make them sour and i was stunned with fear but i couldn't move gripped as i was by a boiling pain and she said i will help you and i cried no 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 i don't want your help but i couldn't stop her and after a while i was grateful for oh, her cool hands on my hot head and, and how she held me around the waist while I, I braced my legs against a tree and pushed and pushed and when the head came out she 
went down on her knees and I felt her fingers in me as she pulled gently at the boy's shoulders till out he came like a hole from a strawberry. And she bent her head and tore the rope between us with her teeth and we were cleaved apart. But then she put him in my arms and he began to suck straight off. And for a moment I felt a perfect happiness. And I looked down at my boy giving suck and I saw her bloody kiss on his head and suddenly I was overcome with terror and even though I was brim full of love, I, I thought I had better kill him. So I went down to the river and wrapped him in my petticoat with some stones. But then he gurgled so prettily, I couldn't do it. I only saw the she-devil once again. Grant them removed, and grant that this your noise hath chid down all the majesty of England. Imagine that you see the wretched strangers, their babies at their backs, and their poor luggage plodding to the ports and coasts for transportation, and that you sit as kings in your desires, authority quite silent by your brawl, and in the rough of your opinions clothed. What had you got? I'll tell you, you had taught how insolence and strong hand should prevail, how order should be quelled, and by this pattern, not one of you should live an aged man. For other ruffians, as their fancies wrought with self-same hand, self-reasons and self-right would shark on you, and men like ravenous fishes would feed on one another. Oh, desperate as you are. Wash your foul minds with tears, and those same hands that you, like rebels, lift up against peace, lift up for peace, and your unreverent knees, make them your feet to kneel to be forgiven. You'll put down strangers, kill them, cut their throats, possess their houses, and lead the majesty of law in line to slip him like a hound. Say now the king, as he is clement, if the offender mourn, should so much come to short of your great trespasses but to banish you. Whether would you go? What country by the nature of your error should give you harbour? Go to France or Flanders, to any German province, to Spain or Portugal, nay, anywhere that not adheres to England. Why, you must needs be strangers. Would you be pleased to find a nation of such barbarous temper that breaking out in hideous violence will not afford you an abode on earth, whet their detested knives against your throats, spurn you like dogs, and like as if God owed not nor made not you, nor that the elements were not all appropriate to your comforts but chartered unto them? What would you think to be thus used? This is the stranger's case. And this, your mountainish inhumanity. I think my time with John is probably definitely over. Because, well, that nurse, she said he might not wake up. And even though I think he might wake up, I'm not as smart as the nurse, so... When Dad left, I thought he'd probably definitely come back. And I waited, and I waited, and I thought he'd definitely come back, but he didn't. And I went to his work and he wasn't there. I called his phone and a woman picked up. So I'm starting to think that maybe John probably definitely won't come back either. I think that all the best people like Dad and John and that 
I think sooner or later they will just all fuck off and just leave me with Mum and Nobby Steve and my brother. <laughs> he won't stop crying these days, as if it was him who lost the love of his life and not me. And I think I'd always be left with Mum and Steve, or Mum and Ian, or Mum and Chris, or whatever the fuck she brings home next, because my mum, she seems to bring home the proper shit ones these days. And I used to think that she was well done in that, but then I thought, well, maybe she's realised that the best ones leave and the shit ones stay. So she brings home people like Steve and Ian and Chris and that until she gets bored and then she could be the one who fucks off to find another Steve or Ian or Chris and that. <laughs> maybe she's a fucking genius. And I think after John, I would do the same. I could do the same. I'll bring back a shit one. And not a best one. <laughs> Except there's no way. And after John won't exist. Because after John, there's nothing but Mum and Nobby Steve and College and Salford. Just like there was before John. And I ain't doing that again. Look, I need to tell you something. Okay. Cool. Yep. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like, and I know I've said this a million times, but that you think I'm shallow. No, I do. I do. And also bad. You make me feel like I'm bad. You're always higher than me. For some reason, you're always higher. It's like when we started, we decided that you were going to be the good person and I was going to be the bad person. Even though sometimes, occasionally, I feel pretty strongly that I'm actually the good person and you, you're the uh... And not just in the heat of the moment. I look back on it and I think about it and I reflect and reason with myself and I still think that there, just there, not always, but just there, I was the good one. See there, just there. This fleeting window of opportunity, what is that? The way you say things. Sometimes I think you use big words to make yourself feel better and me feel worse. Is it some kind of male dominance thing because my paycheck is bigger than yours? Is it you saying I'm doing what I love because I love it? You, you're a seller. You're driven by money and security, but me, well, if I wanted to be a sellout, if I wanted to be successful, then I'd use all the big words in court and people would listen to me because I'm clever in an obvious way. A lot of what you say sounds like that sometimes. A lot of our conversations feel like that. You know what, Mum? I never liked baking. <laughs> never. It was just something that I thought would be nice that we could do together. I've spent so much of my life indulging you in this stupid fascination that at some point I must have actually convinced myself that I enjoyed it. So when you sent me on this weekend baking masterclass away, I went. I thought, yeah, it can't be too bad. I might even make a friend. But no, there I am, surrounded by these 40-something-year-old women flapping about how their husbands are probably sleeping with someone else. But all the while, I've got Sandra stood there banging on about how to make the most perfect fluffy eclair or, or scrumptious flaky strudel. But I got through it because I knew it would make you happy. 
So why, Mum, when I get home and I look into my fish tank, do I find Nick Fury dead? And a bottle of surface cleaner sitting beside the tank. Hmm? Or did you think you'd give a little clean, did you? I loved that fish, Mum. Taking care of him was one of the only things I ever did for myself. So when I asked you not to touch my fish tank, I thought you might do that one small thing for me. I've just been outside, digging a grave. And I want you to know that I'm gonna bury my apron and you inside. I saw a magpie today. There's one. Now, I've never been superstitious, never really. <laughs> but some people are, and that's cool. That's interesting. Some people really go for it. They live by it. Superstition. It's just fear, though. Fear of having no control. Fear of surprise. It's fear and the need to blame. The need for it to not be their fault if something bad happens. The need to hand over responsibility. It's just fear. I saw a magpie today and it felt as though my heart stopped. It felt as though ice was inside me. Like ice was in my soul or my core, like ice was in my blood or something. It felt like ice had stopped me for a minute. And I knew it was just a bird. I knew that. I knew it was just a random bird following a random impulse to fly and land. I knew that, I knew it was random, but it felt like ice. It felt like a message, like a message from you, like you were sending me a message about hope and about not relying on people. It felt loaded and it felt real, very properly real and it felt like ice in my womb. I saw a magpie today and it felt like ice of you and it made me scared it made me scared about what we're going to do about it not actually working so this is my room. This is my phone. I've been sick pretty much ever since I was born. That's me. Y'all. They tried a ton of stuff and now we're at the point where I just need a new thing. So I wait. But I'm a pretty good candidate because I'm young and I came by this crap honestly. 
It's genetic. Yay. Anyway, livers are a robust organ, so it's not as sketchy as it can be, but the whole process is kind of crazy. So my life is kind of crazy. So I'm kind of crazy. Like I've always been kind of sick, but not you can't go to school sick, which sucks like so much. I mean, I'm a senior. I have crucial things to do and then out of the blue my house is like this crappy clinic and my mom is on constant red alert and everything is so weird now. Even the crap people post on my Facebook is weird. Like it's suddenly full of kittens and winky faces and we miss you girl and that is not my style so you wanted to know now you know i don't know what it is about me philip something about my name it feels as if someone's calling me by my name. The name I respond to. Like the other night, I'm walking by the gay place on the corner and I'm walking by it and I'm thinking, you need to go home, you need to work, I had to write a piece for the mail on God knows what, the end of the world is night, that kind of thing. And I'm walking by the pub and it's as if this voice is calling my name. As if this voice knows my name. So I walk in because this voice is calling me by my name. Have a couple of drinks and there's a guy there and he's not even good looking. Actually, come to think of it, he's actively quite ugly and you can smell the beer. You're six feet away from him and you can smell it wafting off his breath and he's got a look in his eyes and he's looking at me as if he knows my name too. He's a bit pissed and he's leering. I mean leering. And I'm thinking, God, you're really kind of gross. And next thing you know, I'm actually standing next to him and he's telling me he's married and his wife's at her mother's for the week and he's kind of talking to me and rubbing his groin at the same time. And next thing I know, we're in a cubicle and I'm on my knees. It's an addiction is what I'm trying to say. No, I don't feel anything like that because I think I know at my heart if it wasn't me, there'd be someone else doing this to you. I think I know in the deepest bit of my heart that actually you bring this all upon yourself. I don't behave like this to most people. I let most people get on with their lives or I share a joke or whatever. But for some reason, with you, I feel the need to bring you down. I think it might be an evolved thing, in a society, in a culture, that if we see someone who's really going to bring down the whole tribe or whatever, someone who's really going to fuck up the rest of us because they're stupid, or slow, or weak, or thin, or short, or ugly, or has dandruff, or something. You have the desire, somewhere deep within yourself, to take them down first and get rid of them and strengthen the tribe. That's all I'm doing with this. That's why I'm inexplicably drawn to you all the time, just poking and poking, and poking, and poking, and poking, and poking, and poking, and being fucking awful to you. And you're right. We are, both of us, Tony and me, we're really horrible to you. You're not imagining it. It was real. But that's why. Because I think it's instinct. And I think it goes on all the time. I think it's actually everywhere. I think 
It's actually how things are supposed to be. You know what you need, Jamie? You need therapy. No, no, please, just... You're a mess, Jamie. I don't know how to make you care about the fact that you completely derailed my sister's life. Like, I... There's a block here. I can't physically understand it. And I don't know how to communicate with someone who genuinely doesn't seem to care about other people. How am I supposed to reach you? You were supposed to be my best friend. What you did is what you did, but it's the fact that you choose not to care that gets me. We always have a choice. Oh, I don't want you in my life anymore. I am so done. I am just so over this. You know what's funny? People like you make it so hard to tell what's right and wrong. Because on one hand, I'm like, violence isn't the answer. Of course it isn't the answer. But on the other hand, there is nothing that I want to do more than to punch you in the face and break your nose so that every morning you have to look yourself in the mirror and your stupid crooked nose will remind you that you deserve it. We always have a choice. Last night, in the middle of the night, I walked our walk again. That walk? The one we took that day? The girl would have freaked if she'd woken and I wasn't there, but I thought, fuck it. I'm going, fuck it. This is the last time I'm here. This is the last time the house is here. I leave, it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm running through the estate to the medical center. Past St. Joey's, past what's his name's house, who was in my class at school and got his eye poked out in a fight at the fifth year disco. <laughs> Not so fucking hard now, are you, when I bastard? <laughs> through the shitty precinct, six derelict shops, a chippy and a fucking spa. I'm outside the medical centre, it's a burnt down shell. I wander through what's left. I'm in the room. That room? It smells of piss as well. Used needles on the floor. It's dark in here. Empty. No sun. When we were here, there was Bright, bright sunshine streaming through the window. A doctor and six fucking medical students. Six fucking medical students and... I'm afraid she's gonna have to have more tests. Six fucking medical students and... She's not gonna get any better. Six fucking medical students and everything that was before we came into this room... Is gone. You're brought back in and you sit next to me. You smile politely, that working class deference to authority. I can't hear anything. I can't see anything. I'm not sure if I'm still breathing. There's something in my stomach and it's rising to my chest, it's in my throat. I'm out the door. We're walking back together, you and me, mother and son. I wanted to, I wanted to, there's something stuck in my throat and I force it down. You're by my side, you look worried. I've never seen that look before. You look scared. I shouldn't be seeing you like this. Children don't see these things. They can't, they just can't. I walk faster, you're trying to keep up. Pathetic little steps, looking up at me. What did he say? I force it down. Must be the change. I force it down.
How long is this? This disease of waiting follows most of us wherever we go. Whether it's waiting in line, waiting for traffic, or waiting for food service, we've been conditioned to have it our way, right away. You don't start out willing to wait. Who does? Our natural response to this painfully easy and underappreciated time is often anger or doubt. We flock to the opportunity of any certainties in seeing our desires fulfilled instantly. To say, I will wait, despite that miserable, uncomfortable, sometimes painful state of silence. You begin to see a limitation of how much you can possibly go in feeling the void of unknown with everything. From educated guesses to fear-inspired myths. And sometimes you give up. With each heartbeat, all that has been left are drops of innocent desire that have increasingly become a torrent of violent mania, accumulating simple words with vast jurisdiction. I want it. I want all. I want all of it now. And as ferocious as it is, it can be tiring to calm that screaming child in you who just wants to get on with it. At no time do these relentless voices stop unless you seek to accept and rejoice. Then you are not just holding on to a particular outcome and that might set you free from the mercy of your circumstances, steering you to a hope that is higher than you. Rather than wrestling for an assurance to come your way, Start by reclaiming what you have lost and neglected along the way. Sometimes waiting is not just about what you get at the end of the wait, but who you become as you wait. You have the choice then to take a deep breath, grow, be blessed by it, and let what is going to happen reveal itself when the time comes. If you're willing, that is. Look on their country. Look on fertile France and see the cities and the towns defaced by wasting ruin of the cruel foe. As looks the mother on her lowly babe when death doth close his tender dying eyes. See, see the pining malady of France. Behold the wounds, the most unnatural wounds which thou thyself did give her woeful breast. Oh, turn thy edged sword another way. Strike those that hurt and hurt not those that help. One drop of blood drawn from thy country's bosom should grieve thee more than streams of foreign gore. Return thee therefore with a flood of tears and wash away thy country's stained spots. Besides, all French in France exclaims on thee, doubting thy birth and lawful progeny. What writes thou with, but with a lordly nation that will not trust thee but for profit's sake, when Tolbert hath set footing once in France, and fashioned thee that instrument of ill? Who then but English Henry will be lord, and thou be thrust out like a fugitive? Call we to mind, and mark but this for proof. Was not the Duke of Orleans thy foe? And was he not an England prisoner? Yet when they heard he was thine enemy, they set him free without his ransom paid in spite of Burgundy and all his friends. See then thou fightst against thy countrymen, and joinst with them will be thy slaughtermen. Come, 
come. Return, return thou wandering lord. Charles and the rest will take thee in their arms. Everything has a solution. Everything can be built. Everything can be mended. <sighs> Do I sound alright, Auntie? Apparently, if you pretend everyone's naked, then you are less nervous. But even the thought of it is making me more nervous. It was the first thing you told me. I remember you said if I do a Rubik's cube, I don't understand logic. You're right, you know. You'd be surprised how knowing that everything can be fixed has helped me. Especially Dow and B and Q. I've been employee of the month for three months running. Did I tell you that? Even this month, when everything got really tough, I guess I just throw myself into it. If you work in a DIY place, everything is either already broken, or the customer needs to fix something broken, or the process of doing DIY has broken them. Sometimes I pulled out the Rubik's cube, and the older customers laugh because they haven't seen one for rages. Once you've got someone to laugh, all the stress, all the brokenness, it's a lot easier to deal with. You told me that too. Guess I've got a lot to thank you for, right? Everything has a solution. Everything can be built. Everything can be mended. I sound lame. Mom says I need to stop, and I can't fix everything. Well, she's wrong. As soon as I get my exam results and leave B and Q, I'm going to medical research. I know it's not engineering like we talked about, but I really want to do it, and it would just feel right somehow. I've been reading a lot about it. One of our regular customers, Doctor Phillips, she says she might be able to help me. She's doing up her whole house, so she's been coming a lot, and we got talking. She works up for one of these big research lab, and she was telling me how brilliant it is when they make a breakthrough. <coughs> a step closer to finding a cure. A step closer to fixing things. Everything has a solution. Everything can be built. Everything can be mended. It was my auntie who told me that. This whole place is literally four middle-class cunts claiming that they escaped the gutter and fight for the interests of the poor when they even went to private school and had shoes that cost more than a year's rent. Like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pay anything for a bit. I feel under pressure trying to make stuff think you'd like, know what I mean? My head's been a bit of a mess. And you didn't like those nudie paintings I did for you recently, did you? So, I think I'm going to knock on the head, mate. Take some time. Remember what I like. I shouldn't be getting fucked and making stuff because I think that's what you'd like. I should just be getting fucked and making what I like. I don't care what you and your mates think. Uh, people like you are cancelled not art because you don't believe in its function and all you see is its price. When you don't realise that actually it's just about being honest and saying most people think it's wank because you're making it wank. Why can't we just make stuff normal people like? And why do you have to be original? Why do you have to be cool? Why don't we just speak the truth in a way that people engage with? 
So fuck off, Lewis. Self-centered, egotistical twat. Hello everyone, my name is Eileen. I work at the Central Hospital. And I'm here to tell you the truth. When the society is governed by fear, does truth still exist? Pretending everything is okay doesn't make it so. After so many people died in our city. We had a chance to review our mistakes. Instead, we're now rewarding each other for overcoming the virus and laughing at the Western world for making the same mistakes. As human beings, we forget things so easily. It's easier to blame and judge those outside of our culture and pushing them far from the society we hold dear. Not so easy to reflect on our system, looking within. Dr. Zhang has passed away. While you celebrate the great victory over COVID-19, have you thought about him? He worked so hard. He missed his own daughter's birthday. Now he will never have the opportunity to celebrate another. Like myself, Dr. Zhang was a key worker. And our leadership didn't care that our lives were at risk as long as they saved face. Dr. Zhang was the first doctor to impose wearing masks during meetings and, and Secretary Tsai. You, you told him to take his face mask off. You helped kill him. And I wonder if you think of him, if, if your conscience is tormented knowing that the part you played in shaming a good man but a doctor. Because as I look around, I see it's, it's easier for people to shake off their responsibilities. You have shamed his legacy and helped cause his death. And what of the doctors who tried to warn us but blamed our leadership? You shut them down. You closed our eyes and you sewed up our mouth. You told everyone we were creating rumors. You shunned us as liars. Now the world knows that they were looking out for us. They were trying to protect us from the pandemic that could have been potentially avoided. I have to apologize to them. <laughs>